Hello, and welcome to the last talk of this session. We're going to try something a little bit different in the spirit of a typical session where we end the DSFP week, the meeting, with an opportunity for you to hack and sort of apply some of the knowledge that you've learned throughout the session. We're going to try to capture some of that spirit here with our last talk in which I'm actually going to be live coding the solutions to problem one. So we'll be working on these things together. The hope is to capture some of the spirit of hacking. And in fact, that's why you'll see I am wearing my DSFP hoodie. All right, I'm good and ready to go. Um, and uh, we've also come up with some problems that are uh, maybe a little bit less straightforward, a little bit more subjective, and therefore require uh, a good sense and willingness to hack. This is also a bit of an experiment. We're still trying to figure out the best way to make the virtual format work. And so if this live coding demonstration um, is something that you really enjoy, we'd love to hear more about that during the feedback. Or if this is really problematic, um, we'd love to hear about that too. Uh, we're also quite aware that most of you are just working on a single laptop. And if you have a single screen, it's more or less impossible to both be trying to type in solutions um, yourself while also looking at whatever's happening during the lecture itself. Um, if you're in that situation, I recommend just watching this lecture right now live and then pausing when we get to each of the individual problems and trying to come up with a solution for a few minutes. And then when you're done or if you get stuck, push play on the lecture again to see how I handled the same uh, problem. Um, in this way, I hope that this is useful. I hope that this live coding demonstration works. But again, if it doesn't, please let us know in the feedback. Um, so today's talk and the reason why this is a bit of a hack is that we're going to be discussing how you actually visualize astronomical images. So we've been focused this entire session on image processing, and we've particularly paid attention to the different ways that you might make standard measurements, right? So how do we measure the flux of a star? How do we measure its position? How do we determine the colors of a galaxy? Or how do we come up with some measurement of its intrinsic shape? And all of these things are things that sort of easily port right into a database. And after you've made those measurements, you can use the database to try to compare a bunch of different objects or something like this. Um, we've also focused on the challenges associated with doing all of these types of measurements with wide field data because it is a little bit more complex than, say, working with a few arc minute by few arc minute CCD. And so um, LSST and everything that's coming out of the Rubin Observatory is going to be a bit more difficult. Now, there is an aspect, though, of visualizing the images itself that can provide a lot of information that is not actually captured within the database. And that's what we're going to try to go over today. Okay. So as every good astro data scientist knows, you should worry about the data, right? Just because we have good people working um, on the image processing itself and the measurements in the database are likely to be accurate, it doesn't mean you should not stop worrying about the data. Okay? And so for CCDs, that means actually looking at the images. Okay, This is something that I think far too few people do, but looking at the data itself is a good way to try to diagnose what's going on. And that is the focus of today's lecture. There's a lot of different things or aspects that I could focus on that we could talk about today, but I want to primarily focus on one thing, and it's sort of a general theme in all of our talks on visualization, and that is salience. Okay. So in every image that you produce, whether you're making a plot to show at group meeting, or you're building some figure for a paper, or you have some giant beautiful slide that's going to go in your next talk, right? we always want to highlight the most important aspects of the figure. So when we're talking about astronomical images, that means that typically if you're showing an image, there's a star or a small number of stars or a galaxy or a small number of galaxies that you're trying to highlight. And we want to make sure that any choices we make while building our visualization highlight those features so that they're immediately clear and obvious to our audience. Okay? So that's going to be the theme I want running in the back of your mind every time you're making a decision about how to build a plot. Okay? As is often the case when it comes to anything related to image processing, Robert Lupton has written some definitive text on building false color images. And in fact, problems two and three, we're going to go over some of the problems and issues that Robert defines in his paper from 2004. 
All right, so let's get started. If you haven't already, you can download the images by clicking on the link provided here. Um, you need this data in order to actually build the visualizations themselves. Uh, that link takes you to a directory called data. You're going to want to download that entire directory. It just contains three FITS images, right? And you want to put that data directory in the same folder as this notebook so you can load all the data with the commands that have already been pre-populated. As a, a very quick background on what the images are, so these are images from this Wiki Transient facility. ZTF has a 47 square degree camera with one arc second pixels and about two arc second seeing. So um, it's a huge camera. In fact, probably one of the biggest CCDs that's out there. Uh, the seeing is decent, uh, not great. Um, it has three filters, G, R, and I. And at this point, it has mapped most of the Northern Hemisphere. In fact, it, it goes below the equator. It's mapped essentially everything at a declination above minus 30 degrees. So if you care about anything sort of within that region, you can go and find ZTF images and time series data um, on the source in question that you may care about. Today in particular, we're gonna use stacked images. So this is using the procedure that you sort of described in the previous lecture. And each of the images has about 16 individual 30 second exposures that have been stacked together. So we're talking about images with an ex effective exposure time of about um, eight minutes or so on a 48 inch telescope, all right? So nothing nearly as deep as what the Rubin Observatory will do, but nevertheless um, sufficient to demonstrate the principles we wanna cover today. So for the first problem, I wanna talk about luminance, which is essentially how do we show relative intensity of a CCD image in a way that is meaningful, right? And how do we pull out the most important and interesting information from an image? So first things first, we need to load data from the uh, uh, image itself, and then we need to display a 2D heat map using Imshow. And if you're not familiar with Imshow, you can click on the link there, it'll take you to the documentation. Um, as a starting point, right, as a quick reminder, CCDs are linear detectors, and so we're gonna use a linear scaling as we display the data in the first problem here. That's the default for Imshow, so you don't have to think about anything particularly difficult there. Um, but essentially what we're gonna do is we're going to now look at what the CCD itself sees uh, when looking at data. Okay, so first things first, we need to load the IBAN data, uh, which we can do using the FITS library within astropy.io. And if you haven't loaded, there are a couple of cells that I skipped for the slideshow, but they're just towards the top of the notebook. You wanna enter both of those to get NumPy, Matplotlet, etc. Um, so then once we have the data in a two-dimensional array called iData, we can create our plot. And the way we want to do that is, um, I like to use subplots, so we'll say fig x equals plt subplots. Okay, and let's make this um, a bit on the bigger side so it's easy to see what's going on. All right, so we'll do fig size equals eight by eight. And then all we need is x show and the 2D data that we want to display. Um, one historical quote for uh, quirk for Imshow is that the y-axis is actually inverted by default. Um, I think this has to do with historical precedent with the way images are displayed in MATLAB, uh, believe it or not. And so to get that uh, correct, we just want to say origin equals lower. And the reason you want to do that is that the images from ZTF have already been oriented so that north is up and east is to the left. And I realize now as I'm pointing to my left, that might be the right on your screen, but as you display the image, as long as you put origin equals lower, you will have the correct compass rows. And then let's um, take uh, the full sort of screen here. So we'll just do a tight layout, all right, as we enter this figure. So we'll run that and the sizing is a bit off. So we're gonna um, jump in and out. And now one thing that is um, a bit bizarre is that this uh, mapping doesn't work in full screen. So what we're gonna do today is we're gonna jump in and out of full screen as we actually look at the images themselves. So here's our eight by eight image. And um, as you can see, almost everything here is just the same color. It's like every pixel has the same value except for all these white areas. And if we actually hover the mouse over some of these white pixels, you'll see that there actually is no value, right? So that means those are masked pixels. We'll come back to that later. All right, so to get a better idea of what we're looking at, why don't we say 
uh, create a color bar. So to do that, we have to create a variable that is, so is associated with the axis itself. And then we can say fig color bar, and we want to map to that axis. All right, and now this color bar is huge and the figure is small. That doesn't look so great. So let's change the size of the figure here. I think if you do a ratio of 0.8, you get a color bar that more or less lines up perfectly. Okay, great. So now what we can see in this image is that nearly all of the pixels correspond to the very lowest range here, right? Something like 180 counts or so. Um, but there are some pixels that are quite bright. So if we zoom in, right, so I'm gonna do that now, and you can do this on your own screen as well, right? If we zoom in, we do see, okay, so there's something that kind of looks like a star. Here's some stars that are a bit fainter, right? Um, somewhere in here, there's gonna be the brightest star. I'm not even sure if I can see it, right? Here's some brighter stars. Those pixels look a bit yellowish at the center of those stars, right? Um, but as we look, right, as we look at this image, uh, we see that, in fact, it's not particularly easy to see any information for what's going on. So let's jump back to our slideshow. Okay. Um, all right, so as I said a second ago, um, the first thing that jumps out is all of the white pixels. And these are, by definition, set to NAN, not a number, because they've been flagged in the ZTF processing pipeline. Um, and effectively, they've been flagged as unreliable or pixels that do not have um, good information. Um, so aesthetically, if you hate the way that looks, we can make those go away by using NPWare. So this is actually a neat trick that I only just recently learned. Um, NPWare can actually be used to output data. So um, anything that satisfies the where command is replaced by your first thing here, and then everything else is just the, um, everything else is replaced by whatever in your second uh, command here. And so we can say NPWare um, if a pixel is NAN within iData, replace it with the median from iData, and we have to say NAN median because otherwise the median will be equal to NAN, and then everything else should just be iData. Okay, so we can actually copy this here, all right, and we'll go back, and we just need to replace iData within this cell with that command, okay? And now we've replaced all those bad pixels by the median value here. Um, now, I'm going to actually um, revert back to our original solution, and the reason for that is that all of these pixels that have been flagged, almost all of them, um, are masked because they've been saturated, and so you cannot get a reliable flux measurement from them. But turning saturated pixels, where essentially the counts are very, very high, into the median pixel value, which is essentially the background, is misleading, and so that's why I'm not gonna proceed with that. But if this was something where you're maybe making an image for a plot, you may wanna do that so that those pixels don't jump out as the most important. Okay, and so we can quickly see some problems with the linear scaling, right? The dynamic range is quite large. We have some, in fact, many pixels that have only, say, a few hundred counts, and other pixels that have 40,000 counts. And with a dynamic range that large, it's very difficult to actually see any structure in the data. Um, as we zoom in and sort of hover around, we were able to pick out some pixels that were brighter, right? We could see the very brightest stars in the image, but that is all that we were able to pull out. We didn't see any sort of galaxies or structure or anything like that. Um, so the typical way that people get around this when using a linear stretch is to adjust the bounds, essentially um, pick some pixel value uh, above which all pixels are then saturated, as far as the visualization is concerned. And if you pick this range appropriately, this can help you highlight the salient features in your image. Okay. So to get a sense of what range we should do, let's make a histogram of the counts in the image. And um, if necessary, you may have to change some of the defaults within the call to matplotlib uh, pyplot histogram. And uh, the other thing to be careful about, you want to be sure about, is that the data that you input, you want to be a 1D array. So I data is a 2D array, okay? But we'll fix that in just a moment. All right, so once again, we're going to um, create some subplots. And uh, in this case, we're just showing a histogram. So something smaller like a 5 by 5 ought to be appropriate. And then we want a histogram, and we want all of the counts in iData, 
the way to turn a 2D array or, or ND array, multiple dimensions, into a single dimension is with the flatten command from NumPy. And uh, once again, it'd be nice to have a large plot here. So we'll do a tight layout command as well. All right, so we can enter that. And you can see almost straight away, okay, all of the counts, as we saw previously, are sort of buried at a very low value of x. Um, and then there's very, very few counts to larger values. So let's change some of our defaults here. I think a couple things we could do. We can increase the number of bins. Um, we can set the range to extend from 0 to looks like 40,000 was roughly the peak of our distribution. Uh, and then because we have this very strange dynamic range here, it might make sense to then also um, set the Y scale to a log scale so that we have a better basis for comparing what we're looking at. So we can enter this again. Okay, so now we see that we have a distribution, right? Almost all of the pixels are at these very, very low values, and then we have some tail to higher values. This tail, of course, is the stars and galaxies in the image, um, whereas this big uh, load here at very low values is the background, okay? And so from this, it seems like, all right, we actually have very, very few pixels out at 40,000. It doesn't make sense for our range to extend that high. And in fact, we'll see if this zoom works okay for me. I don't think it's going to. Oh, that's not so bad. Okay, if we zoom in, oh, I tried, hold on, let's see. All right, so we wanna zoom from here. Okay, so here's a zoom in, we can see a bit better. All right, so again, almost everything at counts of uh, about zero, and the numbers in the lower right-hand corner here are actually messed up, and that's why we'll be exiting as we make plots um, from the slideshow, but you see this sort of exponential decline in the counts. So we probably wanna set some maximum value at something like you know, 5,000, 10,000 or so, so that we are focusing on this range of the data as opposed to the full range that goes out to 40,000 counts, okay? So we have a noise floor at 175 um, with a large tail. So as I said, let's try to clip based on what we just saw in order to create some better contrast in the image. So now for problem 1C, what I would like for you to do is to replot the I-band image while limiting the range that is displayed to extend from lowercase m, we're gonna use this uh, terminology for the rest of the lecture. So lowercase m is the minimum pixel value all the way up to capital M, the maximum pixel value. And I wanna note, some of you may be familiar with MSHOW. It is possible to actually adjust lowercase m and capital M within MSHOW itself, but I prefer right now that you use NumPy to do this, to limit the range, and we'll see why that's an important distinction um, later on in the notebook, okay? All right, so we wanna set a lower value for m and a higher value for m. We know that the um, lowest value in the image is something like 170 or so, and we said that we're gonna pick a number or something like um, 8,000, and we may adjust this in just a second. Okay, and then here we have, once again, to create our plot. So we want to um, open with the same fig size that we had before. I thought eight and 6.4 worked well on this screen. It may be different on your screen or you don't have to adjust that at all, that's fine, right? And so then we wanna create some clipped data. So I'm gonna call this I clipped, and we're gonna use the NP clip array to do this. And we're gonna clip I data from lowercase m to capital M. And then we're gonna display the clipped data, okay? And we always wanna set origin equal to lower. And then based on what we learned previously, oh, I missed this, we want to create an access variable so that we can do a color bar. Okay, and this color bar is for that. And then we should do a tight layout just so that things look a bit bigger on your screens at home, okay? And so we can jump ahead a slide, jump back to center, all right? And, um, all right, we're gonna exit again so that we can look at this here. All right, and so now you can see uh, a bit more structure. It's still not great, okay? 
Um, but there is one feature that's starting to jump out a little bit. I don't know if you can see this on your screen. I'm going to lower M a little bit farther, and I'm actually gonna raise lowercase m. Let's make this 200. So let's collapse the range a bit more in terms of what we're plotting, and we'll replot that. Okay, and so now we see more stars that are popping out, right? All of these sort of green dots that are here. And it looks like there may be something in the upper left-hand corner. Let's make big M even a little bit smaller still. Okay, and now we're starting to see a feature. And in fact, this is the object of our desire. This is the salient feature in this particular image. I'm gonna zoom in to make it a bit more clear. All right, so you can see that there's a nice little nebula right here. All right, there's a nice little nebula. And this is what it is that we're gonna be try, try to focus on in our plotting efforts today, okay? And in fact, in the zoom, you can see, right, there's a lot more stars that are visible um, than previously when we zoomed. This is looking a lot better than what we had initially, okay? All right, so let's go back to slideshow mode. Um, let's, okay, recenter our plot here. I'll scroll down, right? Okay, so um, the stars, right, you can see many stars here. You get a little bit of a sense of which stars are brighter and which are fainter because the brighter ones appear a little bit bigger. That's because more pixels within their PSF are above the noise. And you can also see some structure in the ring nebula here. All right, so this is a lot better than what we had initially. Um, but we're also losing information, right? Uh, so even though it's obvious that this particular star is brighter than this particular star, the cores of all of these individual stars, right, are quite saturated. And so we don't have a great sense of the relative brightness differences between them, okay? Um, and so this sort of highlights a lot of the challenges associated with a linear scaling for our images, right? If you show the full dynamic range, basically everything that's captured by the, the CCD, we only sort of highlight the brightest pixels. Nothing else is really seen. Um, if instead we reduce the range to some narrow region, say, as we did from 200 to 2,000 pixels, all right, then we lose a lot of information about what's happening with the brightest stars, although we do start to see some, some structure, some of the fainter uh, variations that are present in the image itself. All right, so next what I wanna do is more or less the same thing, but we're gonna use a log stretch. Okay, so we wanna see if we plot the log of the counts as opposed to the linear stretch, um, how much better or, or how much worse as the case may be, does that display the data in question? And again, as we're playing with this, I want you to think about what are the salient features of the image. Okay, so once again, let's um, complete what we have here. So we have decided uh, that a figure that is eight by 6.4 looks good when you have a color bar on my screen. Um, on your screen, those numbers may be a bit different. Um, so we want to say I log is equal to NP log of the I band data. So we're going to take the log of the input distribution and then we want to display that. Okay. And every time we make a plot throughout this lecture, we're going to put the origin in the lower corner of the Y band axis. We need to set up a color bar. And I always forget, I never do this. We have to set a variable for the axis and then we can do a tight layout so that things look pretty good. And we'll jump forward, jump back. Okay, and this is looking a bit better. We're gonna exit our full screen just so that we can see this a bit more clearly. Okay, so we now have a range, right? Because we've taken the log, our range goes from down here, something like negative, uh, sorry, something like 2.2 or so, right? The, the log of um, 170, uh, all the way up to, right, up greater than 4.5, because we had some counts up at uh, 45,000 or so, right? And so we can see that this looks a bit better than the linear scaling, right? When you look at the full image here, you can see um, all of the different stars, uh, I shouldn't say all, but many of the stars scattered throughout the image. We also have over here the ring nebula, which has become visible. And um, there's also some artifacts in the image, so I can zoom in so you can see. So um, this is not actually a real feature. That is due to internal reflections within the telescope. These are often referred to as ghosts, right? Um, here's another one, okay? 
Um, so those we don't care about, so we're just going to sort of ignore those for now. The salient image, as we talked about earlier, is the ring nebula, so we're going to focus on that. So here we have a ring nebula. Um, looks like there's a little bit of a galaxy there. And the intensity of the stars actually is not as washed out as it was previously, so that's nice. right? So we don't just have bright, saturated yellow pixels everywhere that there's a star. We actually do maintain some sense of which stars are the brightest by keeping things on this log scale. So that's great. So I'm going to just zoom out one more time and try to do a better job of getting a square here so that this looks nicer in the final representation. There we go. All right, so we'll jump back into our slideshow mode. Okay, and so here we have a nice image um, using a log scale. Okay. Um, nevertheless, it is still true that the brightest pixels are dominating the dynamic range of what's being displayed, um, but fainter structures are far more clear, right? Um, now, this is where it's worth noting that our response, right, the eye's response to intensity is roughly logarithmic. And in fact, historically, this is why we have the absolutely ridiculous magnitude system. Um, while looking at stars in the night sky, uh, the ancient Greeks were just numbering them based on what was brightest, what was faintest, and doing in sort of what they thought was a linear fashion, creating the magnitude scale. And it turns out that when you actually measure the flux, that scale is closer to logarithmic. Okay. So using this logarithmic st stretch, to some extent, mimics what we actually see when we look at the night sky. So that's a nice feature about using a log stretch for the intensity of these images. Okay. Um, and as was the case before, we can do better by limiting the range that is um, displayed after we convert to a log stretch. So for this problem, I want you to replot the I-band data with a log stretch and then put a cap on the minimum and maximum values to better highlight the shadows, right, or the very faint structure that is within the data. And in particular, this is just coming down to, we wanna, um, to some extent, cap what's happening at the very highest range of the data. Okay, so once again, we have, we're gonna use um, PLT subplots. So the first part of this is all gonna look very familiar. So we're gonna say fig size equals 8 and 6.4 and we want to clip our data right so previously we set up i log right we had i log is equal to np log 10 of i data and now what we want is i log clip we want to clip this okay um and i'm going to do this using np percentile so <coughs> oh excuse me what a terrible thing to be in the middle of our recording, right? Um, okay, sorry. So I log clip. So what we want is to NP clip um, the I log data, okay? Uh, and it sneezes always come in too, so here's another one. Ah, I said it and I jinxed it. All right, I'm not gonna sneeze. You don't have to pull your headphones out of your ears. All right, so we're gonna clip I log. And then, as I said, I like to do percentiles here. It's a bit easier than trying to memorize what is the total number of counts and then figuring out um, where it is that you should clip, right? So let's just clip off the most extreme 1% of the data. And if this doesn't look so good, we can, of course, always go back and change this. So we have NP clip, we have a lower value M and an upper value capital M. Uh, of 99.5, all right, I cannot type. Okay, 99.5, so we're gonna clip the data like that, and then we'll use our now familiar plotting commands. All right, so we have imshow of ilog clip. We want the origin to be in the lower portion of the y-axis. We want a color bar, and wouldn't you know it, once again, I forgot to name the Axis variable. There we go. We have a color bar and then we have a tight layout and we'll enter that. Okay, we'll jump forward a slide and back so we can see how things look. Okay, and so it's clear actually in this case that we haven't changed the dynamic range of what we're plotting very much, right? We're still going from about 2.2 up to 4.5. So let's um, clip a little bit more. Maybe we'll clip 
5% of the data. So we'll go from 2.5 to 97.5. Okay. And this still looks identical to what we had before. So let's examine our code and figure out what's going wrong. We have i log is equal to np log 10 of uh, i data. Ah, I think what's happening here is that we have ignored the fact that there's a bunch of NANs in the data. And so we're clipping the data from NAN to NAN, which essentially has no effect. So we need to set NAN percentile. So almost every NumPy function that makes some measurement on an array, you can add NAN to the front of that function to effectively say, ignore the NANs in this array when determining what the output should be. Um, and then let's go back. We didn't get the correct stretch for the first plot we made. So let's remake that plot. Ah, okay. So you can see now, we're still going from about 2.2 at the lower end, uh, but now we're capping the max at something like 2.75 or so, right? We're not even getting all the way up to 10,000 counts. And you can see this is um, in some ways the most aesthetically pleasing image that we have had. So I'm gonna exit the full screen here so we can zoom in on this, okay. Um, but there's stars now all over the image, and you can see a decent amount of dynamic range, right? We have some stars that are much brighter than others. I'll zoom in here on a field, and we can see, right? You have some stars that are very, very bright. You have other stars that are very, very faint. We get a good sense of what are the bright stars and what are the faint stars. Um, but we still have a fairly suppressed background, so we're not so deep into this that the background is really starting to shine, okay? Um, this new choice is showing more structure within the ring nebula. Right, so um, parts of the nebula are starting to saturate here, but you can see that there's sort of edges to the nebula, which is nice. There's a few stars. Um, I believe this one is actually the center of this planetary nebula and then foreground and background uh, stars otherwise. Okay, um, but we have the same issue when we, when we trimmed earlier, which is that many of the stars are now, as far as their color is concerned, saturated. Okay, and we can't make out much structure. Um, I see something else that we haven't seen before. So let me zoom in again on that. All right, oh, and now there's this beautiful galaxy to the northwest of the Ring Nebula that we can now see that, that actually wasn't visible previously as we were doing a linear stretch, right? And this is actually pretty nice. So you can see the core of this galaxy. There's a bit of a bar and then the spiral arms here. And then it looks like maybe a little bit of a halo around this. And it looks like there was another galaxy as well. Hold on. All right, so here's another galaxy. Um, this one's maybe not particularly interesting in its structure, okay? But we're seeing a lot of features that we didn't see previously. So depending on what we're trying to highlight. Um, let's change the limits. I mentioned a moment ago, let's exclude 5% of the pixels. Let's see what that looks like. So this is gonna really bring the background up. So it's gonna force more pixels into the background. Um, it's also gonna cause more pixels to saturate when we do this, right? Okay, so changing the limits there, right? If all you cared about was the star field, this maybe is a slightly more aesthetically pleasing image, right? We can now probably see almost every single star that's in this image. Um, we have the issues with saturation for the things at the bright end, right? They're all being capped. Uh, and so these things don't really look PSF-like, um, but that's okay. We know which stars are bright. We know which stars are fainter. Um, okay, the ring nebula in this case uh, looks pretty bad, right? So that's entirely washed out. That's probably not what we want. This is the salient object. Um, we do get a bit more structure though in this galaxy though, right? So if you cared mostly about this galaxy and you wanna highlight what's happening in the spiral arms, maybe this is a stretch that's more appropriate than what we had previously, okay? Um, and we can see also, right, more structure within that galaxy we zoomed in on a moment ago. Okay, so let me, um, I'm gonna go back and uh, I don't like this stretch. I'm just gonna clip um, just to see one more time. Let's just do the lowest, uh, let's just do the highest 1% of pixels. This will be very similar to where we started, okay? And I'm gonna zoom in on the ring nebula, try to make a square so that that becomes our base image as we move forward here. Okay, so the galaxy looks great here. The ring nebula is washed out. Um, oh, and, and you can even see that there's, right, while there's this uh, strong emission from the ring, there is also emission happening towards the center of the nebula as well. Okay, 
All right, so this is uh, not perfect, and in fact, it's not particularly good for highlighting what's happening in the ring nebula itself. So let's actually adjust it so that the ring nebula looks better, because that is the salient object. That is what we should do here. Um, so to do so, I'm just increasing the range here of uh, where we cap big M. All right. And that looks much better to me. You still get a bit of the spiral arms, which is nice, and you have the structure in the ring nebula without sort of blowing this out in full born saturation. All right, so let's stop there. So we have a lower limit of 0.25% and an upper limit of 99.7. So we're clipping a very, very small fraction of the pixels, but nevertheless, um, that gives us a nice little dynamic range for highlighting our salient object here. All right, so let's jump back into notebook mode, okay and um, moving on, all right? So with the log scaling, right, we, that was the first time we were actually able to reveal the beautiful barred spiral. And I would say that while that's not the focus, showing that spiral is aesthetically kind of nice, right? But as is the case with the linear scaling, in order to actually pull out structure in those spiral arms, everything in the ring nebula got totally blown out. We weren't able within the log scaling to do that for both things. Um, I'll also note, and you'll see this very clearly as we move on in the notebook to problems two and three, that the log scaling, while it does work a lot better than linear scaling, um, is really poor when you're making a false color image. And the reason for this is that um, all those stars that looked like they were sort of saturated in the I band there, right, where it was just pure bright yellow pixels, if you do that for a star in all three of your channels while making a false color image, so both the red, the green, and the blue are all saturated like that, your star just appears white and you actually lose any sort of color information. So the log scaling isn't great for that particular reason. Um, I will say that now it's sort of generally accepted that the best nonlinear scaling that you can use for your CCD images is the inverse hyperbolic sine. Um, an inverse hyperbolic sine, uh, and the equation is here, so you're just taking the log of x plus the square root of x squared plus 1, has a very nice property, which is that for very, very small values of x, the inverse hyperbolic sine, or uh, a cinch, as it's sometimes called, is approximately equal to, to x itself. So you have more or less a linear scaling there. And then as the value of x becomes quite large, uh, it then scales as log. So you basically can get sort of the best of both worlds. Uh, a linear scaling for any features that are very close to your background level, and then a log scaling for bright values so that they don't totally blow out your dynamic range. Okay, and so using ArcSynch, we can highlight all of the features that are somewhat relevant within a particular image. Okay. Um, so next, I just want you to replot the I-band data using an inverse hyperbolic sine scaling. Okay, so to do that, all right, we just need to follow the steps similar to what we had before. All right, we have found that a figure size of 8 by 6.4 works pretty well. And now what we want to do is an M show, and we want to do the arc inverse hyperbolic uh, sine, right, or arc cinch in NumPy, and we want this to be applied to the I-band data. The origin is always the lower corner in this case, okay, and then color bar is always useful, especially if you aren't particularly familiar with the uh, arc cinch transformation. The color bar will give you a sense of what your limits maybe should be if you're going to adjust them for lowercase m and up uppercase M. Um, all right, and once again, as always, I have forgotten to name our axis, so here we go. And finally, we want to do a tight layout. Okay, all right, well, that looks good, so we'll enter that. We have to jump ahead, jump back. Okay, so now with that command, right, we can see straight away that we actually have a pretty good image here. You can see the ring nebula. We see the most salient feature, okay? And we also can see many of the stars that are within this image, although the fainter stars are maybe a bit hard to pull out. Um, so let's give ourselves a chance to zoom in on this image. All right, so when we look at the 
star field here, right? We see a number of stars. You can see many of the faint stars actually still in this image. They're not particularly high contrast, but we also see um, all the brighter stars as well, and they don't look totally washed out. That's a nice feature of this particular transformation. When we zoom in on the ring nebula, the ring nebula looks pretty nice there. We probably could get some better contrast, right? This doesn't quite bring out the edges of the ring nebula in the same way that it did in the previous image that we created, but you do still see some of that structure and it's faint, but you can see the spiral arms of the galaxy, right? Um, and if it's not showing up on your screen, uh, maybe make the plot yourself and you should see it, right? This is probably one of the brighter stars we have in the entire image. Um, that's why that looks very, very uh, bright yellow, but we don't have the same sort of washout that we had in all of the other images. So I would say all in all, this looks pretty good. So let's go back into slideshow mode. Okay, we'll close our image here. All right, so um, not only does this look really good, but we didn't tune anything, right? All we did was punch in arc cinch of the data and we got a pretty nice looking representation. Um, now we weren't able to see in great detail some of the fainter structures or what's going on with that really nice spiral galaxy that's to the Northwest. Uh, but fortunately we can recenter the data so that the low level shadows are closer to the linear portion of the response curve. And so what I mean by that is we can just essentially subtract the median value of the data because remember that for arc cinch, the linear scaling is gonna happen for anything that's close to an X value equal to zero. All right, so let's subtract the median from the data and replot using an inverse hyperbolic sign. Um, and as we messed up in two problems ago, let's not forget that there are NANs in the array that we have to account for. All right, so here we go. All right, at this point, the first part of this problem is more or less uh, the same. All right, um, so we want to do an M show and we want to um, take the arc cinch of the I data, but we want to center the data array by getting rid of the median. Okay, and we need the NAN median in there, otherwise, you're going to end up with. A blank image because everything will be set equal to NAN. Okay, we need a color bar. And as always, I forget to name my X variable. And finally, we want to do a tight layout. Okay, so what does this look like now? Oh, wow. Okay, so this is very different from anything that we had previously. Let's jump ahead, jump back, so we can see a little more clearly what's happening here. Okay, um, so now we see essentially every single star in this image, and that's because we've beat down all of the background pixels, right? And in fact, we have very few things that are at the lowest level, right? Negative four here. Um, we have a sort of much softer image for what's going on. So let's um, quickly jump out of presentation mode so we can focus on the image itself. All right, so our stellar field now looks pretty good, right? This is similar to the log scaling. You actually get a really good sense of what the background is now as you sort of see the fluctuations pixel to pixel. Nevertheless, all of the stars clearly stand out as green, green, yellow objects relative to sort of the blue purple background. So we see all the stars as we did with log scaling. We don't have anything though that's totally saturating, right? We have a good sense of everything, the relative intensities of all of the stars. So that's a really nice feature. Let's look at our salient objects. Okay, so here, um, all right, so now things are a little bit more blown out in terms of what's going on with the ring nebula, right? You can see the star in the center, you can see the nebula. You don't really see any structure within the nebula itself. And we can see the spiral arms of the galaxy here as well as the halo around this galaxy. Um, but it's not highlighted particularly well. Um, nevertheless, I would contend this is pretty good, right? We didn't have to do any sort of tuning. We didn't make any specific decisions about what's our lower limit or upper limit for the pixels. All we did was subtract the median and plot, plot the arc cinch of the data, and we have a pretty nice representation of what's going on in this particular field. Okay, so let's jump back into slideshow mode. 
right? We'll close this image. Okay. Um, I contend that's our best looking image so far, by far, right? And there's been very little effort into tuning. Okay. Um, it is possible actually to correct uh, how well the data look with a softening parameter, okay? Um, and in fact, let's we can try that in just a second, right? But I, I think the upshot here from problem one is very clear. Inverse hyperbolic sign is the way to go if you're trying to represent an image and sort of show the full dynamic range while also highlighting any faint structures that may be close to your noise limit. Okay, so when I say that we can use a softening parameter, and this is in a, an equation that showed below, um, we can essentially multiply, uh, or uh, I should say divide, right? We can divide our data value by some constant, okay? And what that'll do is it'll sort of extend the range over which we have a linear response within the data. Um, so I, I'm just gonna try five to start. And let's bring this down so that it's on the screen. Okay, so we can jump ahead, jump back. All right, and so now we can see, and we have to exit out of the slide server mode here. All right, so now we can see that just by adding that softening parameter, right, dividing by five, we've essentially made more of the image linear as opposed to logarithmic, and we see the structure a bit better uh, around the data. Um, I think we can do even a little bit better um, by, uh, let's see, we're gonna multiply by 0 0.02, multiply by 8, and divide by 8. This is just a random guess, but this is a scaling that works well. Later in the problem, you'll see sort of the full reason why that's a useful thing to do. Okay, but now we can see structure within the ring nebula. We can see the spiral arms, right? This is looking pretty good to me. All right, so let's jump back into the slideshow. Okay, let's lock that image with that scaling. All right, so again, Inverse hyperbolic sign is the best way to display CCD images when you're trying to highlight the luminance of the data. All right, All right so problem two, color. Um, as we have very extensively and previously covered within the DSFP, color is actually not a useful tool for conveying information when visualizing data. Right, we talked about this, but within your tool bag, you wanna convey information with whatever sort of alternative tools you have, whether that be shape or line style or shading, uh, before you go to color, because color is very difficult to directly map, right? Um, and yet, when we were talking about CCD images, where essentially the point of what they are doing is to measure color, okay? Uh, simply put, color wins, right? There is one important caveat, and I'm gonna mention this several times because I do think it's important that we say this again and again, which is that making false color images, as we're going to start to do now, uh, is not always colorblind friendly. And therefore, false color images are not always inclusive. So if you can come up with alternative ways of capturing whatever it is you're trying to do, that can be a very, very good idea. All right, so just to give an example for why color is so important, Right, here's an image, take a quick look, you'll see some galaxies, you'll see some stars, right? And we can see the intensity scaled pretty well, right? We know what's fainter, we know what's brighter in this case. Um, but that's essentially all we know, right? Suddenly, when we add color, you'll notice that one thing really jumps out, and that's that there's a bright red object right in the center of the image. And that bright red object is a quasar, and not just a quasar, it's a high redshift quasar. And by creating this color composite, that object immediately jumps out as one that's different from the typical things that we can see in this particular field. Okay. So making false color images isn't just about you know, building some pretty picture for a press release or anything like that. It's also about better communicating what it is that we are looking at. So a moment ago I mentioned come up with an alternative if you can. Okay, so let's see a sort of base alternative how you might show color information in an actual 2D image. So if you have three filters, say GRI, like what we have for our ZTF reference images of the ring nebula, and you wanna you know, make something like a false color image, our sort of best practices from our previous visualization talks would say, optimize the luminance in each of the individual filters and then show them side by side. 
And this is in fact a colorblind friendly solution, right? So here we have um, blue on the left, uh, green in the middle, red on the right, okay? And so you can actually see that there is structure when looking at all three of these images, um, but it's not easy to sort of immediately map from one image to the next, right? We can add a little bit of spice to this particular plot by changing the color scheme so that it's not all grayscale, right? So things become a little bit more subjective here, right? So now we can sort of, and I told you the reverse, I apologize. We have red on the left, green in the center, blue on the right, okay? And we can start to see some of the differences here. Um, so we see that uh, several of the stars are much brighter in the red channel, right? We can see that whatever is being traced in this nebula, there's less of it that's emitting green light as opposed to blue light and red light, okay? But where this really shines, where you really start to learn about what you're seeing, is looking at this false color image, right? And by putting all three of these together, right, you can actually see, okay, here are the areas where H alpha is being lit up within this nebula, right? Everything that is a bright sort of reddish orange intense structure that's H alpha emission happening within this nebula, okay? So again, this is not just about making a pretty picture. We are now actually seeing real science. And when you're talking about something like a nebula like this, there's no standard way to measure this shape. So this information that you get by looking at this image is information that will never actually be within the LSST uh, database, okay? So unlike say just getting the colors of a bunch of stars, if you don't make this image, you don't know what's going on in this particular case, right? So that's why false color images are so powerful, okay? So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna essentially follow the prescription in the paper that Robert Lupton and collaborators wrote in 2004 in order to make a false color visualization of the ring nebula using the ZTF, G, R, and I reference images. And so this is where I am now gonna pause and uh, you are going to take over working on problems two and problem three by yourselves. Um, I will take your questions when we meet virtually during the final town hall session. Um, I hope this was enjoyable. And again, please keep in mind if this sort of live coding demonstration doesn't work at all virtually over a laptop, let us know and we will be sure to never do anything like this again. Thank you.